So the first thing I'm going to talk about is the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine's recent report uh, titled The Integration of the Humanities and the Arts with Sciences, Engineering, Medicine, and Higher Education, or Branches from the Same Tree. The report was released to the public on May 7th, 2018, um, and was a project of the National Academy's Board on Higher Education funded, and funded in part by the Andrew W. Million, uh, Mellon Foundation. The report committee was formed in 2016 and included a select group, of rep a select group representing academia, non-government organizations, and industry. Um, and as you can see the list there, it included representatives from AACNU, A2RU, which is Arts and Research University Organization out of University of Michigan, um, R1 universities, four-year colleges, and community colleges, as well as industry, particularly from engineering, design, and defense. Um, the individual academic professional disciplines that represented on the committee ranged from biology and women's studies to fine applied and performing arts, history, and science technology studies. The charge to the committee was to examine the evidence of the impact of educational experiences that integrate the humanities and the arts with sciences, technology, engineering, mathematics, and medicine, so that's STEM with two M's. Um, both undergraduate and graduate students in terms of learning and career outcomes. So we observed that curricular approaches in American higher education has arisen out of a history of tradition of educational integration, originally called liberal education, introducing students to a full suite of human knowledge with a goal of preparing them for work, life, and civic participation. However, today some faculty and leaders in higher education are questioning if today's higher education allows students to appreciate the connections between the disciplines. So throughout our meetings and our guest presentations, we noted that supporters of an integrative approach in higher education argue that an education shaped by disciplinary specialization may not best serve the learning and career goals of most students or prepare future generations to address the complex and often unpredictable challenges and opportunities that will face the nation and the world in the 21st century. This excerpt that you see on the screen is from the preface um, from our chair, David Scorton, um, who is the secretary of the Smithsonian Institution. And it pretty concisely describes our findings, some which we've already discussed this morning in many ways. Uh, we found that large controlled randomized testing of hypotheses that integrated education would lead to educational and employment benefits are rare and likely to remain so. Nonetheless, we found abundant narrative and anecdotal evidence, some evidence from research studies and very importantly, a broad national groundswell of interest in developing approaches to integrated education. Though casual or causal evidence on the impact of integration on students is limited, it is this committee's consensus opinion that further effort be expeditiously exerted to develop and disseminate a variety of approaches to integrated education and the further research on the impact of such programs and courses on students to be so supported and conducted. The committee came up with a list of 16 recommendations, only a few that I'll highlight here. Recommendation number one, the available evidence is sufficient to urge the support and evaluation of courses and programs that integrate the arts and humanities with the natural sciences, social sciences, technology, engineering, mathematics, medicine, and higher education. Our recommendation number five, Professional, artistic, humanistic, scientific, and engineering societies should work together to build, docu to build document, and study integrative pro pilot programs and models to support student learning and innovative scholarship at the intersection of the disciplines. Recommendation number 13. When implementing integrative curricular, faculty, administrators, and accrediting bodies need to explore, identify, and mitigate constraints, such as tenure and promotion criteria, institutional budget models, workloads, 
accreditation, and funding sources that hinder integrative efforts in higher education. And finally, recommendation number 15. Both federal and private funders should recognize the significant role they can play and do play in driving integrative teaching, learning, and research. The committee urges funders to take leadership in supporting integration by prioritizing and dedicating funding for novel, experimental, and expanded efforts to integrate the arts, humanities, and STEM disciplines. So as a National Science Foundation program officer, I led a program called Creative IT. Um, the program brought together disciplines associated with creative and scientific advances to encourage new ways of thinking about one discipline in terms of the other. The Creative IT program was active from 2000, uh, 2007 to 2010 and funded approximately $34 million in research grants from its program budget and shared funding with other NSF directorates, including the Computer Information Science and Engineering, or SICE directorate, um, Education and Human Resources, and Social and Behavioral and Economic um, Sciences directorate. So the awarded Creative IT projects responded to one or more of the following research areas. The first one being theoretical models to understand creative cognition and implications for computer science. So in this project, distributed creative cognition and choreography, the principal investigators, David Kirsch, who is a cognitive scientist at UC San Diego, and Wayne McGregor, who's a choreographer of the Random Dance Company, um, collaborated. And here we see students at the University of California in San Diego who are studying creative collaboration and distributed cognition with the choreographer Wayne McGregor and his classically trained random dance company. It's very interesting because Wayne McGregor has a very specific vocabulary that he has his dancers learn, but then it's actually a collaborative and a group process when they're coming up with their actual choreography and their dances and their pieces. The next area that we funded was software engineering to develop and evaluate creativity support tools. When we talk about creativity support tools, it's a term that actually Ben Schneiderman brought um, basically into the field. Um, we're not only looking at um, computer tools to do creative things like Adobe. Photoshop, but how can we build all types of tools that help us and help people creatively problem solve in whatever field that they're working in, right? So here we have Expressing Dramatic Character and Dialogue, a toolkit for creative exploration and linguistic style. The principal investigators were Marilyn Walker, who's a computer scientist of nat in the Natural Language and Dialogue Systems Lab, and Noah Wadrup Fruin, who is a game theorist and the director of the Digital Arts and New Media um, MFA program at UC Santa Cruz. Um, they were exploring natural language processing techniques for language generation and dialogue management, for building narrative structures for authoring compelling and engaging games. The next sec um, section that we uh, funded, a category that we funded, um, breakthroughs in science and technology stimulated by creativity theories and practices. And I thought it was very interesting the example that we just saw um, of the soundscape um, looking at basically how um, carbon and sound and noises are changing over time. If you understand the history of the electronic arts and artists, you'll understand that there actually have been artists who have been doing that type of work for, for decades, but not necessarily doing it so that it gets published in a scientific journal um, or within the community. And it's really exciting then to see that students are picking up on that concept as well and taking it to next levels, especially since our technology is more sophisticated now for being able to find those patterns. So here we have a project called Kyra, a creative, artificially intuitive reasoning agent in the context of ensemble improvisation. It came out of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, and the principal investigators were Jonas Brosh, who's an architect and a computer scientist, Selmer Brings Bringsford, I'm not sure if I'm saying his last name right, sorry, um, who's a cognitive scientist, 
And the late Pauline Olivares, who is a composer, um, was part of the Center for Deep Listening, also at RPI. They were exploring communication patterns in musical improvisation as an influence and a method for the development of artificial intelligence, or as I like to call it, artificial intuition algorithms. And then finally, we funded an area, an innovative STEM education approaches that encourage creativity. So here we have Scratch 2.0, cultivating creativity and collaboration in the cloud. Uh, the principal investigator was Mitch Resnick from uh, director of the Lifelong Kindergarten Group at MIT Media Lab. So the Creative IT program funded a broad range of approaches um, to learning that encourage creativity, multidisciplinary teaching and learning, design studio um, environments, skills development through making and doing, serious games, and open-ended problem-based learning. So after the conclusion of the program, because Creative IT was actually designed to only exist for a short time period um, at the National Science Foundation, um, I funded a series of workshops to continue a dialogue among the creative IT research community. The National Science Foundation and other synergistic federal institutions and universities. Our first workshop was the first joint um, effort ever between the National Science Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts. With my collaborator, Joan Shigigawa, the former senior deputy chairman of the NEA, a workshop was convened, much like what we're doing here today, at the NSF headquarters, with over 60 national and international thought leaders from federal agencies, universities, and nonprofit organizations. Uh, we participated in an all-in voices, all voices in, two-day deep dive gap analysis on the state of art, science, and technology, um, education research and practice in U.S. higher education institutions. Editing down over 100 pages of raw notes from the brainstorming sessions, it was a two-day session, I worked with my collaborators and the Grove International, a world-renowned graphics facilitation firm, to design this story map to tell the narrative of the issues and opportunities for the emerging field of art sciences and technology. The workshop started by asking everyone the big questions that they're thinking about. Um, these are big, uh, that they're thinking about in terms of their research, their practice, or their institutions. And so an example of some of the questions that came up were, how can we tap into the passions of youth to transform them into in employment skills? What is the role of the arts in complex issues like climate change? How can the arts and humanities work in service of solving larger problems? How can educational institutions enable art science learning? How can we break down silos in university curriculums to foster art science collaborations? And how do computing and culture come together? We discussed what we saw, and this was in 2010, as the drivers and trends, which I think are still the drivers and trend, trends today in 2018. Um, here we have three of them listed. Creative innovation economy, which is the regional development through transformative discoveries and innovations. Informal learning for public audiences or STEM aptitude through creativity-based activities and vice versa. So it's not one service the other, but is they're both um, benefiting each other. And open source thinkering, more creative minds inventing with new open source tools and methods. So, as I mentioned, our main goal for this workshop was a participatory gap analysis to identify the successes, the hurdles, and the potentials of higher education, pedagogy, research, and professional practice that intentionally integrate creativity, technology, and engineering for a range of outcomes from open inquiry to solutions for our global challenges. As well, our goal was to assess the spaces where the National Science Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts, among other agencies and organizations, might be able to provide um, support for such efforts. So looking a little bit closer at our gap analysis, and I'll just talk about the challenges here because I think they're um, 
they probably will resonate with many different disciplines that are represented here at this workshop. I won't go through the opportunities because I think they're unique to this particular, that particular group at the time. But the challenges that we discussed were um, divergent values. So real and perceived differences in how we validate what we value. The next challenge was scholarship. Demonstrating impact of art, science, and technology research is difficult as research archives are not linked. So for example, like I said earlier, there are artists who have been working in sonifying data for a long time, but is not linked necessarily with um, the areas of research that are represented here. 21st century learning. There has been enrollment decline in uh, computer science programs, while programs that integrate computational thinking and arts are increasing. Um, networks of excellence, art, science, and technology networks in the U.S. tend to be part of academic clusters. They are vibrant yet closed to those outside of the system. And finally, resources. Long-term funding initiatives are needed to maintain U.S. competitiveness in the international art, science, and technology research arena. And I think you can replace that with the disciplines as well that are represented here in this room. So the story map then ends with what we call the future state, the future state. Our discussions led to a brainstorming about what we saw as this future state. Now in many ways, these things actually did exist already at that time, but it was a way to say that this is kind of a space where when we think about that, this particular form of integrative learning, teaching, and, and research um, could nurture and support. So, First, we look at a converged review criteria. Everyone here is familiar with the National Science Foundation, so you have intellectual merit and broader impacts, and we add into that artistic excellence from the NEA. We were looking at a place, we were hoping for a place and or a mindset where STEM to STEAM, inquiry and intuition, cultural heritage and scientific discoveries, creativity and innovation, rigor and curiosity, preparing the 21st century workforce and innovation networks and learning spaces can thrive. So to conclude, to take us back to the National Academy of Sciences report, where we talk about branches of the same tree. So thinking about Einstein's metaphor that all disciplines of human knowledge are branches of the same tree. The trunk of the tree represents the core from which disciplines in higher education are founded. The branches are where Einstein located the religion, the arts, and the sciences. If we think about it, branches grow away from the trunk, remaining intricately connected to the core strengths of the whole and yet separate from each other. Extending the metaphor, there are natural energies that flow freely through the rigid structure of the tree that fuel the health and or demise of those branches, from sunlight and water to insects and parasites. Like those natural energies, integration, the intentional crossing of boundaries to explore different ways of seeing and knowing, can result in a more insightful, enriched, and broader platform for inquiry, innovation, and discovery. So integration is the fuel that enables our ability to recognize, understand, challenge, and build the platforms in which impact innovations are realized. Thank you. Hi. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, our question at the table was, um, this is a great model and a great idea, but as we heard from Laura earlier, NSF can't fund grad students at least, for humanities and art. So are there funding mechanisms in place to do this? Um, well, it's, it's a very good question. So I'll talk a little bit, again, I'll bring it back to Creative IT, which was designed to be um, a pilot kind of experimental program coming out of SICE. So the projects that I showed you, among the many others that were funded, actually were about collaboration across the arts, humanities, sciences, technology. And so within those projects, yes, fund students, or at least their work, or the work with their professors uh, was funded. Um, there actually was an IGERT that finished in 2010, I just looked it up, I remembered it, um, that came out of UC Santa Barbara that, that was at the Media Arts and Technology Program at UC Santa Barbara, which um, I don't know the students were funded, 
but it was IGRT funded and it actually looked at arts, design, computer science and engineering, um, particularly in looking at data visualization and other new kind of experimental ways of thinking about technology. Um, so it has happened. Uh, when I was at Creative IT, I specifically um, worked with some colleges of arts and design uh, that were doing some very interesting work, which I would say was as competitive as what's coming out of R1 universities, but perhaps were not part of that ecosystem of the NSF. Um, usually around eagers, you know, because as you know, it's, it takes a bit of time and ramp up to get to the point where you can start to get some core um, uh, grants through the regular review process. Um, we were really interested that your keynote followed Laura's, and it seemed like um, almost a provocation, right? If, if NSF wanted to really experiment and go really broad and really disciplinary, here's some ideas. I mean, I guess it would be really interesting to hear you say more about why that's valuable and, and a little more about what it looks like in concrete terms. Sure. Well, creative IT was very concrete, so it's not just a provocation, it did exist. Um, the, the question is how do then initiatives like that find a way to actually become part of the core programming so they continue to exist? Now, it's not to say that there aren't programs at NSF that continue to fund um, projects like the ones that I showed you, but you kind of have to know where those programs are and who the program officers are in, in terms of their interests um, in that area, particularly if you're going to say, okay, I want to do a collaboration with a world-renowned choreographer, um, you know, about, um, you know, cognition, you know, it's like those, um, those possibilities exist. Right, but under a specific program right now at NSF, to my knowledge, I don't think it exists. I'm not on top of everything that's going on at NSF right now, so I don't want to say that it doesn't. Right, um, you can particularly go into the education directorate as well if you're looking at the, the STEM to, to STEAM um, area, particularly in advancing informal learning sciences. Also, does a lot of research or a lot of, funds a lot of projects that bridge the arts and design and uh, STEM learning. <laughs> 